Hi, everyone who's joining us right now. We are just going to wait another uh, 30 seconds to a minute for everybody uh, to join. And, uh, and then uh, I will start with the introduction. All right, so I think we can get started now. I don't want to take a, a time out of, uh, of uh, our uh, today's speakers uh, uh, talk. So we are gonna get going and people will still uh, trickle in, I'm sure. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for another seminar in our uh, Health Law Institute uh, speaker series. We have a phenomenal speaker today. We are very, very excited um, uh, for the talk. Um, my name is Adelina Iftene, and uh, I am the Associate Director of the Health Law Institute here at Dalhousie University. Um, before uh, before I, get, uh, I get started with the introductions of Professor Stein, who's uh, our speaker today, uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, issues that I want to make you aware of. So um, uh, you will see that today we have an uh, ASL interpreter, uh, Roxanne. She is, uh, she is going to be here for the duration of the event today. So if you are interested um, and um, you want to, to have the image in LART, I recommend that you uh, pin, uh, to, uh, pin her, uh, her screen so that uh, you can see her better. Um, secondly, we have a, a closed uh, captioner, live closed captioner here today as well. So if you, if the uh, subtitles did not come out automatically for you, uh, please go on the, on the bar down. You are going to see closed captioning and you can turn them on. So you can, you can use that uh, function as well. Um, the webinar is being recorded. The audience members are not going to be uh, captured in the in the recording. It's just going to be the speaker, the host, and the ASL interpreter. Um, uh, but uh, we will make the recording available uh, after the event on uh, on YouTube on Schulich School of Law's uh, YouTube channel. Um, and. Uh, and finally, you are going to see that there is no chat function, and that's because uh, we are uh, uh, we have a lot of participants. We have uh, we are over a hundred people in audience already, so um, we are not using the chat function. We are using the Q and A function for the uh, um, for the questions. Uh, Professor Stein will speak for thirty to forty minutes, after which time, or as long as he would like to, and uh, uh, subsequent to that, we will open it up for a Q and A. Um, I ask that you type your questions uh, in the Q&A box and uh, I will be fielding the questions after the talk and uh, uh, put them to Professor Stein. So please uh, feel free to start typing whenever you want. I, I will see them all. So you don't have to wait until after the talk. I will see them all and, um, and, uh, and fill them. Um, so with that said, I am going to uh, provide a brief, brief introduction to uh, Professor Stein. It's not going to be very long. He has a lot of accolades and a lot of accomplishments. So uh, I could uh, take the rest of the hour reading them, but I'm just going to, um, to uh, say a couple of words about him before, uh, um, before, uh, before he starts. So uh, Professor Michael Stein is the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law School Project on Disability and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School since 2005. Considered one of the world's leading experts on disability law and policy, Dr. Stein participated in the drafting of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. Um, he works with disabled people's organizations and non-governmental organizations around the world, actively consults with governments on their disability laws and policies, advises a number of UN bodies and national human rights institutions, and has brought landmark disability rights litigation globally. He has received numerous awards in recognition of his uh, transformative, uh, transformative work. And I do encourage you to uh, look online in our event. You're going to find more information about Professor Stein if you're not familiar with uh, his work. 
Um, uh, that said, I am going to uh, turn it to you now, um, Michael, and uh, I'll turn my camera off and I'll come back after, uh, after your talk for the Q&A. Thank you again for being here. We are all very excited for your talk. Well, thank you ever so much for, for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I have a long history of interacting and working with our friends to the north and a big hello to our Canadian Council of People with Disabilities and the Human Rights Commission, both national and, and provincial. And of course, my good friend, Steve Esty, who owes me quite a number of Alexander Keith's Pale India Ales. It's a, it's a privilege to be here with you. We're going to talk about people with disabilities and, and COVID, um, but let's start then with, with what we don't know, what we don't know. At least as far as the US and certainly beyond it, what we don't know is actually generally what the numbers are of persons affected and felled by COVID. The reason for this is that the numbers we have in the US of some 240,000 deaths are those that are marked on death certificates, not those that are measured as against the expected number of statistical deaths per year. When we look at the latter, we're somewhere closer to 310, 320,000. And so people are passing on, people are suffering and passing on, um, but not noted as, as falling to COVID. Instead, their death certificates are providing things like pulmonary disease or heart attacks or, or pneumonia. As far as the disability community, people with disabilities have not been disaggregated in the US as far as COVID fatalities. We are maintaining data on race and gender we are maintaining data on age and some of the age overlaps will coincide with disability, but we don't have disability specific data. And so we're lacking information on that respect. We have some general information. Uh, we do have information such as deaths in group settings for persons with disabilities are running at something like three to one that of the general population. And we believe that something like 30 to 40% of all deaths are occurring to elders in congregate care facilities. And again, there's an overlap with the disability population in that respect as well. So we're not getting an accurate number as far as people with, with disabilities. We're also not getting an accurate number or a sense of what the impact uh, is on people with disabilities. And by that, I mean, what is the impact on their access to public health or just to routine healthcare access? We are starting to see studies that do that. The Monaghan Institute at Massachusetts General Hospital is gearing up a project next month that will look at marginalized populations, among them persons with disabilities, and figure out what the impact is as far as their health, including their mental health, which is a huge issue for everyone during this pandemic, but we're not getting that information. We have a small study that we're going to be starting at HPOD, Harvard Law School Project on Disability, probably in conjunction with the Monaghan folks, in which we will be interviewing persons with intellectual disabilities, <coughs> sorry, living in congregate care or group care facilities and find out what the impact is on them. From anecdotal evidence, from speaking to the populations that we work with at HPOD, meaning the self-advocates with intellectual and other disabilities, we know that there has been immense impact upon their access to regular routine healthcare. And I can give you an example of that. We have one self-advocate we've worked with for many, many years, who last February was scheduled for a basically routine, but rather serious operation. He was admitted into hospital in February. Um, his operation was immediately stalled because of the COVID prioritization. And so he was shifted from the hospital basically to a nursing home, to a long-term care facility. He's a person with intellectual disability and with cerebral palsy. He opens, also happens to be a person of color. And he's been stuck in that rehabilitation facility ever since. His day-to-day -day health has decreased because of lack of access to basic services such as physical therapy, 
um, lack of access to his family and his network of supporters. Last week, he was scheduled finally for this operation. And after the post-op procedures where they were assessing his health care, they found out that his condition had deteriorated to the extent that they needed to reschedule his operation yet again, because now he needs to have a more serious operation. So this sort of anecdotal evidence is what's coming to the fore. It has not been systematized. We're hoping to get more of this information in an empirically valid, usable manner. Outside the US, we are starting to see um, we are starting to see studies of the impact upon disabled communities around the world. Um, there was a study on women with disabilities in Kenya by Women Enabled. Uh, if funded, there will be a study coming out of Bristol on people with disabilities in Kenya and in Uganda. And there is, of course, the information that has been posted routinely on the Disability Rights Monitor, which you can access online. So that's what we well, we don't know. We also don't know what the impact is on people with disabilities in their care during periods of COVID. Um, there's a small article that my friend Omar Sultan Haik and I wrote that's available online in the Journal of Health and Human Rights about COVID and, and disability bias among clinicians. But this is more or less theoretical um, and is not based by empirical evidence. We don't know what happens at the point of, of treatment. Having said that, before we pivot to what we do know, I think it's important to emphasize that the frontline workers, the hospital and other public care people are absolutely heroic in their efforts of, uh, in, in fighting against COVID. Um, this has been a pandemic of epic proportions and many people have worked valiantly through the healthcare system, often Without, without thanks, often without adequate recognition. And of course, we're all very grateful to them. So what do we know? Let's pivot to what do we know? Um, we know that in times of, uh, of non-pandemic, marginalized populations, whether persons with disabilities, indigenous groups, racial groups, and others, women as well, um, are often put towards the end of the hierarchy in receiving adequate public health and access to health. We knew that the beginning of COVID, at least in the signal in the United States uh, from on top, was that people with disabilities and elders would be likewise shifted towards the back of the line. We heard that in two respects. We heard that from the beginning by the Trump administration and the uh, president's statement early on, once he would recognize that there was a COVID pandemic, which took months to do, um, that it was not a serious thing, but rather it would only impact upon those who weren't so healthy or those who were older, meaning people with disabilities, elders, uh, and the overlap in between. So it was very clear that the federal government would not be paying any special attention to vulnerable and marginalized populations. In fact, quite the opposite. We also saw from the scientific community in pieces published in high level medical journals such as JAMA and the New England Journal of Medicine, pieces, for example, by Zeke Emanuel, that we ought to be thinking about triage. How do we allocate limited resources? And in thinking about triage where doctors and others cannot treat everyone always with the same level of care, a situation, by the way, which we have yet to see come to fruition, thank goodness. But in those hypothetical circumstances, according to Emmanuel and others, people with disabilities should be deprioritized as those who have greater health needs cost more, according to him, um, they ought to come last in line. So we saw that people with disabilities were not exactly front and foremost as far as thinking about who would receive health care. Then we had something called the Critical Standards of Care, CSCs. This is guidance that's created by state by state, created by medical professionals on what to do in circumstances of resource limits and emergency situations such as this. Most of these were created before the pandemic. Many of these have been amended during the pandemic, either at the early stages 
or more recently. And I won't give you the numbers on it. I purposely did not bring PowerPoint on it because there's an article coming out by myself and some friends. And to be honest, we really need to recheck our coding and make sure our data is absolutely tight before we do that. But I'd like to describe some, some trends for you because this is actually a positive trend. And the trends have been pushed by the disability rights community, by the people with disabilities and their representative organizations, which we often call DPOs in the literature. I can't describe for you some of the backdoor negotiations and political pressures, because those are not public, but we can describe some of the things that are in the forefront. So just to give you a general sense of CSCs, those triage directing documents, what we've seen is um, at the beginning, before the pandemic, there was a number of, you know, like 68% 68, 68 or so of these CSCs included categorical exclusions of people with certain types of disabilities and others. Early on in the pandemic, though, there was a pushback against this, mostly by complaints filed at the Office of Civil Rights at the Justice Department in DC. And the Justice Department ruled that you couldn't have categorical exclusions and also that you couldn't have discrimination against people with disabilities. And we saw a decrease in, in these revised CSCs of categorical exclusions. As far as the use of long-term survival as a means of assessing whether or not to treat people at points of emergency, right, when their lives are in danger, who do we prioritize? We see a curve of before the pandemic, you know, a level of here on use of long-term survival, then an increase of it, and then a decrease of it when some of, of the advocacy came to, to bear. The focus on resource intensity, how much resources do we have to use per individual with the assumption that people with disabilities will need higher amounts of resources. We've seen a decrease in the CSCs across the 50 states as far as whether that is a valid basis for, for prioritizing healthcare. We've seen a dramatic increase in the inclusion of reasonable modifications, what you may call reasonable adjustments in Canada and elsewhere, as far as CSC use. Should clinicians and others be thinking about reasonable modifications to the basic care that's been provided in order to accommodate people with disabilities? An increase that way. And we've also seen a dramatic increase in the number of chronic ventilator protections meaning people with disabilities who have ventilators and use them before COVID because of various conditions. We were hearing stories and seeing regulations that would authorize healthcare providers, meaning hospitals, to remove their, chronic, remove their ventilators and reallocate them to people without disabilities. I mean, think about that. That's kind of like you know, taking away your wheelchair or taking away your white cane when you get to, to the hospital because someone else can use it. Clearly something that is both illegal and also unethical as well as just highly, highly troubling. So that's just a broad overview in terms of, you know, trends as far as these CSCs. To backtrack for a minute. So in the US, despite our not having national health care, which is you know, a tragedy and a mistake that is being really highlighted during this COVID pandemic. We're the only industrialized nation not to have a functioning systemic health care. And of course, that has been, you know, that for whatever health care we do have nationally, um, that has been pushed back several, several steps by the complete ineptitude of those individuals in Washington who have denied the existence of a pandemic denied the ability of the federal government and the state governments to coordinate, um, have, have just been complicit in the creation of the greatest public health failure probably since the Middle Ages and the bubonic plague. Um, but we don't, we don't have that. Nevertheless, under the Americans with Disabilities Act and under the Rehabilitation Act, providers of healthcare, including in the COVID context, are required to not discriminate against persons with disabilities in the provision of healthcare. 
And that's fairly clear. Um, it's also clear under the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, sometimes called Obamacare. So let's look at those specific criteria we just discussed in the CSCs and talk about what's being used and what's not being used and what's, and what's going on. Um, early in the pandemic, Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights issued a bulletin indicating that persons with disabilities should not be denied medical care on the basis of stereotypes, assessments of quality of life, or judgments about a person's relative worth based upon the presence or absence of disabilities or age. And that's a, a direct quote. Um, but part of the problem with public health, both in the US and elsewhere, is that quality of life judgments remain very often posed as neutral and empirically valid, and yet have within them stereotyped and weighted values about the lesser value of the disabled life and the lesser quality of life of those who live with disabilities. We see this in empirically neutral things such as qualies, Q-A-L-Y, quality adjusted life years, and in dailies, D-A-L-Y, or disability adjusted life years. These are neutral, quote unquote, empirically based, so they say, but I doubt, value judgments that were created by the World Bank and the World Health Organization in the 1990s in advance of thinking about a push on improving global men, uh, public health, both physical and mental. The qualities and the dailies were put together without having disability experts included in their generation. It was as usual, typically, bioethicists, medical doctors, and others. And it's unclear how much stereotypes went into the basis and generation of these neutral criteria. So under Dallas, for example, there is no assessment of context. The disabled life is worth roughly two thirds that of the non-disabled life, regardless of where you are living and what your supports are. So if you take someone like myself who uses a wheelchair and lives in highly developed Cambridge, my life is stated to be the same value as that of my path, you know, pathologically and, and uh, duplicated twin in Bolivia who doesn't have assistive technology, who doesn't have access to healthcare and so on. So there are problems with the dailies and the dailies to begin with. There are other problems again with these neutral criteria of public health often used by people like Professor Emmanuel, Professor Govind and others in speaking about triage in that there is something different in disability and the way it is treated than any other group across the board of, pop, uh, of marginalized populations. Assuming that disability-related healthcare costs more, which it likely does, um, assuming that the disabled life is only worth two-thirds that of other lives, which it isn't true, but let's assume for the moment that it is, why is this considered a valid means of allocating healthcare? We know, for example, empirically in the US that people who are white live longer, have better healthcare, and have better outcomes than people who are black. And yet we would never, at least above board and on their face, create standards of care that say, we ought to allocate healthcare to black folks after we allocate them to white folks, because white folks due to their better socioeconomic status are more likely to go back to the hospital if symptoms arise, get follow-up visits, have better outcomes because of all the social determinants of health. We would never, ever, ever, ever say that. And yet here with qualities and dailies and with triage, it's been assumed that this is a neutral, non-prejudicial and acceptable way of allocating public health care. This is a problem. This is one of the issues that we've seen. We've seen. Um, there have been categorical exclusions in some of these CSCs, fewer now than when we began the pandemic, about who can receive care in the COVID emergency situation. What do we do when we have to allocate limited resources? But categorical exclusions are absolutely prohibited 
under US non-discrimination law and really ought to strike us as an affront to morality and to dignity. An example for just to throw one out that the Office of Civil Rights remanded was the state of Alabama, which basically had a rule that said those with intellectual disabilities and a specifically targeted Down syndrome should not be considered eligible for ventilator services. Clearly, this seems like overt discrimination in its clearest sense. Categorical exclusions are based on classes of people, not on clinical events or clinical times. And both the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act makes it clear that this is prohibited. And yet there are still some categorical exclusions within these CSCs. Long-term survival. Here's another one that is interesting. Um, many CSCs utilize prospects of long-term survival, how long you'll survive after the initial trauma treatment related to COVID as a qualification for the receipt of life-saving medical treatment. This criteria is both ethically and legally inappropriate. Um, it's also empirically questionable. Um, you know, we, we don't know, we're not God, and we don't know how long people will survive after receiving emergency services. The ethical problem with it is, of course, that the reason we provide life-saving care at the point of being close to death is that we're intending to save people's lives. Not that we're intending to have best outcomes, not that we're trying to secure the long-term survival of various individuals. The other problem with it is that it's often the result of structural inequality and notably on the basis of race and class and disability that certain life limiting conditions exist such as diabetes, obesity, or COPD, which is a you know, chronic lung and pulmonary kind of disease. Many of these diagnoses, even if they can be linked to disabilities though, are often heavily influenced by societal priorities when we talk about disability and the allocation of research and treatment resources. In other words, there's a reason why, even if their long-term prognoses are different, why they are different. So for example, over the last 30 years, people with cystic fibrosis and HIV AIDS have both realized a dramatic expansion in life expectancy as the result of public and private research investments emerging from the activism of in these individuals and their families. This shows that survival expectancy from a particular condition is not the result of random choice. It's not the result of empirical reality. It's not inherent, even when you have the diagnosis, but rather it's instead a collective choice about what conditions deserve investment. Stop for a moment and reflect upon the billions and billions of dollars that have been spent on cancer research, and rightly so. I mean, we've seen the prospects of children with cancer surviving rise, right, from about 15 or 10% in the 1970s to something like 90% in 2020, and that's wonderful. But many of these life expectancies, right, they're not inherent, they're not inexorable, they're based upon collective social choices. Other categories like Down syndrome and cystic fibrosis that are not relevant right, to the essence of the program. And, you know, why, why should we think about whether someone with cystic fibrosis or Down syndrome is going to live as long as someone without cystic fibrosis or Down syndrome when the whole purpose of life-saving treatment should be to save these individual lives? Another allocation decision, another thing that's been driving these CSCs and triage decisions has been resource intensity. You know, and one of the foundational principles of disability law is that we need to accept that there will often, sometimes often, be some degree of inefficiency or some kind of increased cost in order to modify or accommodate the needs of people with disabilities in the name of equality of opportunity. We can debate how much of this is inherent in the disability and how much of this is inherent in the social and cultural conditions of how we prioritize and create our world. But if at the moment there is a larger cost to it, 
that's exactly what a reasonable modification is supposed to go to, right? I mean, we're supposed to modify the way that we provide public services, including healthcare, based on disability, and in Canada, other, other features, based upon whether it is reasonable or not, not based upon whether it exists or not. The other problem with the, with the resource allocation arguments has been that hospitals and clinicians cannot accurately predict what the availability is of resources weeks from now or months from now. We just don't know. So being able to say to clinical providers, let's look at what the cost is now and let's see if there's going to be follow-up costs later is just not empirically valid. It's not sustainable. So those are some of the issues that we've seen with the CSCs. So overall, again, we've seen an improvement uh, in, the, in the CSC guidelines. We've seen the inclusion of things like reasonable modifications, reasonable accommodations. We've seen a decrease in categorical exclusions. We've seen a decrease in the use of long-term care as a condition. Um, some of the short-term care conditions, which I didn't talk about, uh, are valid. You know, a clinician is supposed to decide at the point of contact zone is in front of them. Will this person survive with the treatment? And that is sometimes can overlap with, with disability and pre-existing conditions, but it can also sometimes overlap with non-disabling pre-existing conditions or conditions that we don't always include or think about as falling within the disability ambit. Most of the changes that we've seen in these CSCs have come about due to the advocacy of people with disabilities. That shows us a couple of interesting lessons. One is, once again, the power of the community, whether it's communities of people with disabilities, first peoples, uh, people of, of various racial origins, women, LGBTQI, et cetera. But we see the lesson that those who, act, who advocate and those who connect with their policymakers can influence policy. It also shows us that in promulgating these standards of care or in promulgating IRBs, internal review boards, or in promulgating ethics committees at hospitals that decide about you know, standards of care, not only within pandemics, but elsewhere. We need to have people with disabilities as stakeholders involved. More often than not, as in the case of the development of the DALIs and the QALIs, people with disabilities were not consulted or included. And when people are consulted and included in the development of neutral, and objective, in quotation marks, criteria, we see a greater sense of occlusion and a greater sense of equality. So that is some of what we're seeing in the US and abroad, um, both what we don't know and what we do know. And I'm happy now to turn back and to dialogue with you with any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Professor Stein. That was. Uh... I want I wanted to say initially uh, fabulous, but it's actually very depressing. So um, um, thank you for that. And um, I would like now to open the floor for any any questions that uh, that people may have. I already have a couple here, so we're going to start with uh, these ones that have come through during uh, the talk, and then um, uh, hopefully there uh, will be more uh, coming. So um, somebody is asking here. Um, if you have any idea of how individuals who had their ventilators removed may be able to obtain justice, and uh, if um, so, on one hand, if, if you know they will obtain justice, and second, what are their options from from that uh, perspective? Well, if I was in Canada, I'd, I'd contact you know David Baker, um, your, one of your better or best disability rights lawyers, or one of the provincial human rights commissions. Um, and, and see what kind of redress you can have. Hopefully you haven't seen it that much in Canada. I pray that you haven't. Um, beyond that, you know, we are living in a digital world and you know, going out there through social media and letting people know that the University of X's hospital took away my ventilator and put me in, in dire condition or took away my whatever's friend, you know, spouses, whatever's. Um, ventilator and endangered them or, or maybe even killed them. Um, 
would be a good way of trying to raise awareness about it. I, it seems to me just you know demonic um, that a hospital or hair, or healthcare provider would do that. Um, of course, the what's reported outside the U.S. and Canada, you know, is also way worse than than what we're hearing in the U.S. and Canada. But that doesn't excuse it anywhere, anytime. Um, I'm going to read the next question. Given the failure to collect data specific to people with disabilities, both generally and in relation to experiences with an impact of COVID-19, a particularly profound health determinant uh, at present, how would you assess the utility and or efficacy of Article 31 um, and 35.2, uh, the reporting to the committee of the conventions for the rights of persons with disabilities? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And of course, it also is contingent upon your country having ratified and being willing to implement two different things, the CRPD. And as you know, the US remains one of the uh, 11 UN member states that has not ratified the CRPD, which is a cause of frustration and shame to many of us in the US, especially those of us who worked on the CRPD. Um, but assuming that your country has, um, clearly it's a failure in data collection, not only under the CRPD, but also likely under the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which have a you know, target and indicators regarding access to public health. Um, it should be reported to the committee. It should be reported to the WHO. It should be reported in as many places and, and and venues as, as possible. Um, another really interesting question, how do you foresee these kinds of principles you have described applying to the distribution of a limited vaccine in the US? Oh, that's a, that's a marvelously acute and also troubling question. Um, it lost in, in some of the rhetoric about vaccines with some over optimism about two to three uh, drug providers going to the drug administration and requesting emergency permission to create a vaccine has been two things. Um, one, which you didn't raise, which is the efficacy of the vaccine. Vaccines only tend to work, you know, in 60 or 70% of the time. People who, you know, do get the flu vaccine annually still do get the flu. People who have had the pneumonia vaccine still do get pneumonia. I did when I showed up in India and got a strange strain of it. Um, but secondly, once these vaccines are being created, and even assuming that they're safe and efficient, there will be priorities, right? And some priorities one can understand, right? So healthcare providers and frontline workers getting access to it so they can keep us all well seems to make perfect sense. But beyond that, it's clearly going to reflect, right, some kind of hierarchy, urban over rural, socioeconomically privileged over those who are in poverty and have less access to information as well as healthcare. It's going to be a problem. And I believe, and I hope that I'm sincerely hope that I'm wrong, that it's going to mirror the inequalities that we see currently in, in access to public health. Speaking of which, you know, one of the strange things that has been said about COVID, and, and it's totally untrue, is that COVID is the great equalizer, meaning that everyone dies. It's not the great equalizer. Those who are privileged have way better resources and access to resources. If you're living in a country or a place, even here in the United States, that does not have access to clean water, you are not, <laughs> This is not the great equalizer. If you can't access the internet for information or if you can't possibly order shopping in, you know, by the internet, you're not going to be doing as well. But what COVID has done is it's shown, you know, it's shown a really clear light on many of the gaps and inequalities that exist within our societies. And we're gonna see that with the vaccine part as well. Okay, so here's a, a long one. Uh, I think there are actually a couple of questions in here. 
Um, does anyone actually believe that qualities and delis are conceptually or ethically neutral, as opposed to being driven arguably by uh, the neoliberal agenda to emphasize or enable the commercial turn in healthcare and to forefront health system economic efficiency? In other words, have there uh, been resounding defenses of them and support for them? Um, and uh, related to this, have they been subjected to detailed and sustained ethical critique? And if so, what alternatives to these tools are being suggested for the emergency and resource allocation setting? That is a wonderful ball of questions that I need to unpack. <laughs> but it's a wonderful, wonderful set of, of questions. Um, before answering it, I, I'd like to preface it by saying that utilitarian ideas, the greatest good for the greatest many, is, is the foundation of public health allocation. And most of the time or much of the time, it functions fairly well. And you can kind of understand why it would be used and why it would function. You know, we all have limited resources at some point and how we spend them needs to be figured out based on various criteria. So I'm not against the utilitarian idea. I'm not against the resource allocation idea. What I am against and what dailies and qualities bring to the fore, as you point out, are the inclusion of unstated assumptions, baselines that are not neutral, that are referred to as neutral, as if, of course, everyone knows that they are neutral. Much like, you know, until the 1980s and probably for many people still today, they'll say, well, of course, women are not as efficient as men as workers, or that disabled persons cost more or that people of color are not this or not that. These things which have gone by the by in many other groups remain, remain within the context of disability, not only in public health care through dailies and qualities, but through others. Does anybody believe them? Well, Zeke Emanuel, who's been one of the more influential public health people clearly believes them. The World Bank still uses them. The World Health Organization uses them. Um, they have come under criticism. If you just do a Google search of dailies, qualies, disability, you'll see a number of critiques that come up, very intelligent, thoughtful critiques. And yet they're still used as kind of the flawed or, or in some people's minds, not flawed, best available instrument. To jump out of public health and to go to philosophy for a moment, it's kind of like looking at John Rawls and the theory of allocation from behind the veil and then criticizing him by saying, but you didn't include people of color or people with disabilities. Well, you have a solution in both these cases. You can either say, throw out dallies and qualies throughout behind the veil, or you could say amend dallies and qualies, or you could say amend behind the veil to include people of color and people with disabilities. I've seen different approaches in each one of these different areas. Um, to me, it would be a matter of revising the dailies and qualities by having persons with disabilities, their perspectives and priorities included in actually looking both empirically and philosophically at the quality of life and the context of life of people with disabilities. Um. There is another question here. Um, are there examples of the inappropriate deployment of mental health legislation to detain a person with a disability with COVID who might face barriers complying with public health restrictions? I believe you can find a fair number of them anecdotally on the Disability Rights Monitor, which is global and which has something like, as of today, maybe 1,300 or 1,400 complaints and stories and, and um, and anecdotes from all over the world. Um, I think you can find that. But your question also raises a related question of, you know, when we are trying adequately to treat persons with various disabilities as far as COVID or as far as public health, are we actually thinking about diverse groups? So one thing that's been clear is, I believe there is a very great lack of plain language guidance for those with intellectual and cognitive disabilities. There's been a lack of thinking about what happens when we isolate people with various disabilities. What if you're on the spectrum and you're being put into the ICU, intensive care unit, uh, 
without access to your friends, connectors, and supporters. We need to rethink across the board on public health and COVID in, in a bizarre sort of way can enable us post COVID to think about where our failures are and where there is rooms for moving forward. So it has been a bad story, um, but there are also good parts of it. We see the disability advocacy making changes and we're seeing areas that we can mark out for thinking about how to progressively change public health. Um, all right, so um, we are, we don't have any more question in the Q&A. Um, I'm wondering if there are, if there are people who prefer to come out and ask their question loudly, if they want to, for whatever reason. Okay, I, we do have one hand up. So uh, let me, let me look for that. I was just realizing that perhaps there are people who um, do not wish to type. So, um, okay. So we have somebody called Vicky here. Um, I gave permission to uh, Vicky if you want to come on. And ask Thank her. you so much. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, I live in Nova Scotia and I'm chair of several different disability rights organizations. And what we're just fighting right now, which you guys in the US have kind of figured out, we're trying to get institutions at large scale congregate living places closed. I unfortunately have to live in one because the government says there's nowhere else to put me um, to get the care I need. What exactly did you guys do to make that stop? Because I will do anything at this point. So you guys have already in the States, you've already done it. So any advice is that we started out trying to get these horrible places um, well, you know, we, we still have a way to go. Um, and I guess it's all which side of the which side of the grass is is greener. I worry about about the surviving institutions and congregate care. Um, but we've had two sort of waves of, of deinstitutionalization. We had the 1980s one brought about, of course, by the advocates and their families within the ID community, and then also within the psychosocial community. And it was kind of a perfect storm because it occurred during the Reagan administration when Reagan was downsizing government in his words, but really they weren't downsizing government. What they were doing was shifting the cost of the federal government from the federal government over to the states. So the same amount of money was being spent. It's just, it was called something else. Um, and the administration then, besides having the advocacy movement peak, the administration came out with documents about how it's more efficient for people to be living within the community than to be living in large scale congregate care. Um, we saw a lot of good outcomes from that. We saw a lot of bad outcomes from it. Um, you know, classic bad outcome was New York City in the 1980s. They opened up the psychiatric hospitals, which is good, um, and let people out, but they did it without support. And those people wound up either in jail or dead, um, much like in South Africa about two years ago at the SC Dimeni life, you know, life institution. So one was that, that was one wave of movement. The other movement was more of a legal challenge. We had the Olmstead decision come out of the US Supreme Court it's our version of Brown v. Board of Ed for the disability community. It stated that people with disabilities should be entitled to live in the least restrictive setting. And then it remained stagnant for many years until the US Department of Justice began to bring deinstitutionalization cases systemically, beginning with the US South, which had the, best, the, the worst practices um, and began pushing for people to live within the community. So there's the availability one of, of movement by people like yourself, Vicki, and, and your supporters, you know, protesting, speaking about needing to live in the community, raising hell, because you should. Um, maybe, you know, raising hell at the CRPD committee. Canada doesn't like being embarrassed, much like other states don't like being embarrassed um, in front of the UN. And then there's the matter of legal challenges. You have one of the marvelous, marvelous, you know, Supreme Courts. And 
you know, a challenge to not living within the community, I think would likely, if, if framed well, um, be considered appealing, you know, by that court, not only under CRPD, but also under the, you know, the Canadian Charter, right? I mean, fundamental rights. Um, you have a right to live in the community and you ought to be pushing for it. Um, so um, very connected to to your last uh, to your last remark, um, somebody says um, in Ontario this summer a court rejected the challenge to visitor restrictions, which prevented the supported decision maker to enter and support the patient with disabilities while hospitalized. What is your view of the appropriateness of courts as a redress? Um, they were asking for these particular situations, but I think uh, we could go further and say generally the appropriateness of courts as a redress for much of the issues that we talked about today well you know it's it's a it's a funny irony because i'm a lawyer who teaches you know a law professor who teaches lawyers and who you know has has been involved in you know in bringing legal challenges you know i've got 20 something at the european court of human rights and other places um, and there's a place for for law um, but one would hope actually that good common sense and more expedient ways of bringing it than going to court, which are expensive, timely, very much favor those in better socioeconomic circumstances who can get a lawyer, um, that there should be better ways of doing it. Um, if I, you know, not knowing what happened in Ontario, and I'm sorry um, for, for these people's pains, one would imagine that going to the hospital's ethics board or raising it on social media might be a, a more expedient and less expensive way of challenging exclusionary practices. Um, but first, of course, you know, it all comes down to people to people, and I have no idea what happened in that case. Um, but very often, you know, people can be made to realize that it's in their self, in their own best self-interest. So for example, explaining to the hospital that it's not just my right to come in as a supported decision maker or the patient's right, all of which is true. Um, but gosh, it would make it so much easier for you to understand the patient and to understand their wishes if we were to facilitate their communication can be framed as a sort of win-win rather than in, in oppositional. But again, I have no idea what happened um, last summer. Um, somebody says, uh, we are currently awaiting amendments to our medical assistance in dying legislation. Many people are concerned about people with disabilities not being protected and being pressured to choose MAID or having other, others make the decisions for them. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I remember the discussion um, and, and I was asked um, by some folks in Canada to chime in on the discussion. Um, it's a very difficult area because one can imagine various circumstances where an individual would want facilitation and end of life decision making. And yet at the same time, we always worry about social stigma and pressure just in the ambient culture about being a person with a disability, about being a burden, about being less worthwhile than others. Um, I happen to be one of those liberal types who has gone so far left that I have a small libertarian streak and am generally in favor of assisted suicide and other kinds of palliative care if there are sufficient safeguards. It always comes down to whether there, if, if there are sufficient safeguards and many people within the disability community um, will feel like there aren't or that there can't be. Um, but that's what I think about it. Um. Thank you. I, I have um, one or two questions of my own before uh, we don't have any more questions from the participants, but I do. Uh, we have another 10 minutes. So if people want to ask questions, please either raise your hand or uh, or fill it in the Q&A uh, box. Um, otherwise, I'm, I'm curious regarding uh, I, I want to go back a bit to the uh, issue of triage protocols because um, that has, has not been an issue in Canada, but the reason why it hasn't been an issue in Canada, and I don't even think it has been discussed to the extent to which it was in the US, is because uh, we didn't have the, um, we didn't have the uh, very significant issues that, uh, um, and outbreaks that the uh, that US had, right? So we didn't, we didn't reach the point where um, that was that big of a concern. So I'm not sure how that would have gone uh, 
if we did have them, right? Um, so um, what what does the what do various international bodies say on that precisely regarding U.S. responses to that? Like what what did the for instance the World Health Organization were there any comments coming out of them? Any guidelines? How about the UN? Like was there was there any uh, significant and meaningful engagement in terms of the highly problematic protocols that were created in the U.S. and probably in other countries as well. Um, and uh, and uh, or or did they just come out with their own guidelines in that? What was what was the feel on that? Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm unaware of of international critiques specifically of, of these. And remember, they're not national guidelines, they're state-based guidelines, province-based guidelines. Um, and so we have, you know, 50 something of them. Um, we do know that, you know, the Secretary General at the UN was very good in, in, you know, making a statement about valuing everyone and treating everyone, you know, under COVID and et cetera. Um, WHO is, is very ecumenical in, in that way as well. Um, it's, a, it's a, a very troubling thing. It's also troubling because if you actually read some of the triage guidelines, you know, these sort of death scenarios, should we allow three people to die to allow one person to live? You know, it's, it's framed as if, as, you know, by these people as if the medical profession is doing something noble, however difficult. And yet, you know, even here, with the current surges that we have because of all the foolishness and the ineptitude, you know, plus COVID, plus, you know, magnified by foolishness and ineptitude and by our federal government um, and the orange psychopath. Um, even so, hospitals have not reached capacity. You know, these, these triage emergency guidelines have not been put into effect. Um, it's good, I guess, that you plan ahead for all contingencies. Um, but the way it's been put forward, it's, it's been framed as if it's more of a reality than it has been. And while we need to be concerned about the CSCs that are made with invalid criteria, I think as a nation, we need to be more concerned about why are we the only industrialized nation not to have a valid national healthcare system? Right. Um, so just to, to push a little more on that, what in terms of the triage protocols, how how should they look like? Like how how do you envision them? Is there because I mean I, I would imagine there is a role for them, right? It it could be that there is uh, in the current situation where you know the healthcare system is not what it should be. So then how do you how do you envision them in a manner that's actually compliant with both international and national human rights? Uh, of people with disability knowing uh, very well that um, most of the triage protocols, unfortunately, uh, are significant, include significant discriminatory clauses against, uh, against the various groups. Including the reasonable modification idea, you know, that the, the basic course of treatment needs to be done um, with reasonable modifications, understanding that disability law requires an individual assessment so that we're not treating groups of people at a time, we're treating a patient after a patient after a patient. Um, and to be fair to the clinicians, although I, you know, I do write on clinical bias and do other things, to be fair to the clinicians, I happen to be one of those optimistic people who believes that most healthcare practitioners at the point of service are acting in good faith and trying their best to deliver adequate and effective healthcare interventions. Um, you know, the problem with many of these broad, vague guidance, whether it's, you know, triage under COVID or whether it's legal capacity and involuntary, you know, involuntary treatment, is that at the end of the day, it comes down to the clinician and all the social biases or lack of biases that the clinician is carrying and the individual patient. Right. All right. All right. Um, thank you so much. I don't uh, see. Oh, there is one question actually. <laughs> um, uh, could you comment on ableism and its role in responses to the COVID pandemic? Oh, okay, great. Well, 
you know, we would we would construe ableism not just as as prejudice against people with disabilities, but we would think about it more broadly as the idea that those who are biologically atypical within society, meaning those who are not white, European, male, heterosexual, able-bodied, and, and Christian, and so forth, um, are those who are, have lesser value and ought to have lesser access to resources within society, be valued less than and those of others. I think we saw it front and center with Trump's pronouncement on don't worry about COVID even if it exists. It's only the less healthy and the elders um, who will die from it. I mean, those were his statements, gruesome as, as they are. Um, I think we, we see it in the activities of various groups um, who fit within the ableist category who are running around without regard for others no masks, no protections. It's my choice. Well, yeah, but we do live in a society together. Um, I think it's been very clear, all the cracks in society that are coming to the front could in some way be tied back to ableism. And we could make disability justice arguments about why they're wrong and why they ought to be thought of differently. Okay, I don't see any more questions and we are almost at time. So we are going to conclude here. Professor Stein, thank you so very much for, uh, for uh, giving this uh, very enlightening talk today. I think that uh, me, um, that it was, uh, it was uh, really very um, helpful to hear you talk and to clarify a lot of the questions that we had. Um, Thank you so very much uh, for that. And uh, thank you to the members of the audience who have attended today. You will be able to find the talk uh, on the Shuley School of Law's YouTube channel, uh, should you want to rewatch it or share it. Um, and uh, we're going to have the next uh, speaker series seminar on November 20. So hopefully you're going to be joining us then. Thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.